<laughs> okay, thank you everybody for being here. For this very first slide, it's in, um, I just want to let you know that I'm with you. I'm a part of the uh, audience in this first slide to, to kind of take this part in. So if you could all uh, pay attention to the screen for a moment, and I'm going to be with you on this one. Okay, so <clears throat> three things. That's a big number. We're going to talk about student debt and higher education today. And I'm not Brandon Busteed, in case you were wondering. I know you guys probably saw, we're very confused. You saw the notes, student debt, higher education. We're going to talk about this. We're going to work out all the problems. And you thought, that's got to be Brandon. No, sorry. I know there's a lot of similarities, but uh, that's um, unfortunately I'm not, but I'm still going to try and, and do my best. Um, I wanted to start, get this question out of the way if I can, which is the question about is student debt the next housing bubble? I'm going to spoil the suspense for all of you right now and tell you that I don't know. I really don't know. And nobody does for that matter. But there are some things that uh, I want to share with you, a few ideas, a couple facts, and, and things that I used to hear about the home buying process that now I hear about the student loan process that are eerily similar. And I think if you wouldn't mind showing me some nodding of the head, if you kind of see this too, I would appreciate it. So home debt is currently at $13.8 trillion, while student loan debt is at 1.3, rounding down, right? We're, we're moving our way toward 1.4, um, adding about close to $100 million per year in student debt. So there's your fact. And this, here's some thoughts that just came to mind as I thought and thought about it. What I used to hear back in prior to 2008, 2007, the housing crisis, even as far back as the early 2000s when people were buying houses in Omaha with the move from Lincoln to Omaha, I'd hear things like this. You should, everyone should own a home, right? Everyone should go to college. They're all going to go up in value. Just like you're always going to make more if you have more education, right? Buy a little more than you can afford because rates are low. Or go to the best school possible because it'll pay off. And rates are low. Don't pay off your home early because it is good debt. Everybody heard that one before? Good. Borrow whatever it takes because it's good debt. Owning a home is part of the American dream. And of course, becoming a college grad is as well. Go with an adjustable rate mortgage because that'll get you the lowest payment possible and the lowest rate. Or perhaps on the other side of that, stay in school longer so you can defer the payments because it's, it's a tough world out there, right? If you need to qualify, just get a cosigner. Or on the other side, just have mom and dad borrow it for you. Don't worry about the cost, just the cost per month. Or don't worry about the cost because you're, <laughs> I talked to my wife about this and she said to me, I had no idea until my last day at college when I met with the advisor and he gave me payment options. They're gonna give you payment options at the end, right? So to answer that question, is this the next bubble? I have no idea. And the truth is, I really don't care about that question. I care about everybody in the room and everybody at Gallup and your family members and how you're going to handle, whether it's the student loan debt that you have or the student loan debt you think you may be incurring in the future because you have kids getting ready for college and how to avoid that, how to save for it. Those are the things I care about. Um, home's a great investment or college education is a great investment. Is it? I don't know. This is a quote from Warren Buffett. If you Google this quote, you won't find it. Well, you might find it deep in an article, um, but it's not one of the quotes that Warren Buffett's known for. The problem comes if and when the income from the producing asset falls or reduces. I pulled this out at the middle of a very long article from Warren Buffett on talking about leveraged investing. Leveraged investing is just a fancy way of saying borrowing money to invest it. So he was talking about literally borrowing money to make an investment, buy a stock, buy a mutual fund, right? 
But if you flip this and start thinking about it in terms of st a student education, you realize that the investment is your education, right? The knowledge that you gain from a school experience, borrowing money to invest. It's leveraged investing. And this quote perfectly depicts the situation that a lot of us are in, a lot of America is in, at $1.3 trillion in debt. The problems, it's fine when the asset that you're buying is producing income, right? The asset that you're buying in this case is an education. The income that it's producing is the job you get when you graduate. The problem comes if and when the income from that asset falls or reduces. And we've, a lot of us have experienced that. The housing crisis is a part of it. Not as many jobs or, or difficult to make the, uh, make the type of income you need to to pay off that debt. That's when leveraging becomes a problem. So not even Warren Buffett is against leveraging, but he is in this case. Okay. So I told you this was three things about my that my mom and dad taught me about student debt. This is my mom right there. Isn't she a pretty lady? Uh, this is my dad right here. Grandparents and the baby, grandparent, great-grandparent in both pictures, grandmas. And then the baby there is my oldest brother, Alan. Oh, right? <laughs> so uh, when I started thinking about this, there's a few things that came to mind and the first one was um, my dad would often tell me this story um, sorry <laughs> strike that he would tell me the story I lived this one uh, he I remember never forget the moment that I got a C when I was in high school in biology now, I was a good student I wasn't a great student but I was a good student I was a good enough student to get A's and B's without really giving much of an effort okay um, I was more concerned about girls and sports and all the other stupid things you're concerned with in high school, right? I got a C in biology, and we sat down, I'll never forget it, sat down for dinner at my grandma's house. It's just me, my dad, and my grandma, and my dad was just letting me have it. I mean, he was out of his mind, right? He was sitting there going, Ronnie, you're a better student than that. I talked to your teacher. And she said that you probably need to move seats because you're talking too much, shocker, and you're just not applying yourself. All of this unequivocally true. I was not applying myself. I was embarrassed. I, ne I hated to disappoint my dad. I hated it. And to have my grandma there to witness this just made it worse. I sat there for just a couple of minutes and grandma gets up and leaves the room. Maybe three minutes she's gone. She comes back and she slides a piece of paper next to my plate. Now, my grandma was known for dropping us a few dollars every now and then, so I kind of, first thought was, oh, she's, she feels so bad for me, she's giving me money. I don't know. <laughs> but I look down at this piece of paper, and I see that it's old. So I pick it up, and I open it up, and at the top of the piece of paper, I see report card. And then I see the year, 1954. Then I see the name, Elton R. Miller. My dad, I almost didn't recognize it. My dad doesn't go by Elton, he goes by Royal, his middle name. So, and then I realized, oh, this is my dad's report card from high school. And then I see the grades. And it looks something like this. <laughs> my dad was not a good student. <laughs> I love my dad, respect him tremendously. Uh, but he was not a good student. So as I handed him this old piece of paper, without even looking at it, he says to me, Ronnie, we expect more than that from you. And this is the first thing I want to talk to you about, which is the greatest gift that I got from both my parents was, and still is to this day, clear expectations. And I'm not just talking about grades. And I'm not just talking about higher education aspirations. I'm talking about clear expectations, you know, in, in life, in whole, in a whole. Winners make a habit of manufacturing their own positive expectations in advance of the event. This is a quote from Brian Tracy that I absolutely love. If you're a parent in the room that has kids going to college, 
Clear expectations for you, is, it comes in the form of open conversations with, with your high school age student, because that's when you really should be starting to talk about um, higher education is when they're in high school. And presenting just the cold hard facts, because to a high school age student and to anyone, trying to prepare themselves for college, the known is always clearer than the unknown. It's always less scary than the unknown, right? And I think everyone deserves that. My, my uh, parents did that with me very easily. It wasn't a hard conversation. Ronnie, my gift to you when you go to college is a ride. So here you go, good luck. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say, though, that that's the right thing for everyone, because it's not. If you are a parent and you have aspirations to financially support your child, great. If you can't because of the planning you've done, great. But they need to know. They have to have clear expectations of what it is that, that um, you, you expect from them, what you want from them. So talk to them, right? You have to have the talk if you're a parent. And it's not one time, it's ongoing. And if you're looking for a place to start this conversation with your high schooler, I have two great resources to point you to. But one is our very own Great Jobs, Great Lives report from the Gallup Purdue Index. I was reading this in preparation for this presentation. And I'm like, why aren't, why aren't parents and, and their high schoolers talking about this? Why aren't they talking about what, what other college alumni have said made their college education worth it. These are the things that they identified that made their, high, their college education worth it. They were a heck of a lot more likely to say it was worth it if they had uh, professors that cared about them as a person. They had at least one professor who made them excited for learning and a whole slew of other things that you, if you talk to your high schooler about it, they can set themselves up for success. They can know what to look for when they get there. Or maybe if enough colleges start to take this and spend their dollars to make these experiences happen for college kids, we can improve that for all colleges. I can't stress this enough in talking to your high schooler about high demand educations. Who in here, by a show of hands, can tell me that they knew when they were in high school what they wanted to do as a career. I'm impressed with all of you. I'm, that's awesome. I had no clue. And I think based on the results of this survey I just took, I'm in the majority, maybe 80%. No idea. But man, it wouldn't it be great to know what are the high demand career fields today? Wouldn't it be great if there were an entity that had that type of information that could put it in front of you? The highest demand career fields projected for, let's say, the next decade. It exists, right? Scott DeWorth is nodding his head. Yes, because he gave me this. Thank you, Scott, by the way. The Department of Labor Statistics puts this information out. Project out to year 2024 what they think are the highest demand career fields. And the only way solve what is a supply and demand problem we have in the higher education is by supplying more people to those high demand fields, right? So why not, if your child doesn't know what they do, why not talk to them about high demand career fields? And then jointly with your child, create a, a college financial plan. It sounds more sophisticated than it is, not easy to do, but very, very doable. We're taking into account how much you've saved or not saved as a parent, what type of financial aid they'll get after completing their FAFSA or doing an estimate of what their FAFSA will provide, <coughs> and then determining how much they'll need to borrow, if any. If you're in here, you're not a parent of a high school age student, um, but you're more here to discuss the student debt that I've already incurred my advice to, would be to take a true and honest look and account of where you're at right now. If you haven't done a balance sheet, time to do one. We'd love to sit down and talk with you and do one. Figuring out how quickly can I pay it off, and we're gonna get to some practical application of how quickly can I pay it off during this presentation. Everybody bring a calculator and a pen? Okay, I hope so. Um, we're gonna talk about that a little bit. And then, what lifestyle changes might I need to make 
in order to make this make sense, in order to get that done in a fast way so it can quit robbing me from building wealth. Because some of the student debt stories that I get the privilege of hearing from our associates, that's exactly what they're doing. They're robbing them from the ability to build wealth over the long term. We're talking about 20, 10, 20, 30 year payoff periods. That's too long. You can't afford to be in debt that long. I think I, this is my second reference now to Warren Buffett. And I think part of it is because one of Warren Buffett's quotes is, is known for um, having the quote of invest in yourself. Has anybody heard that one? They've had it on billboards even, right? So I can't under, uh, overemphasize just how important uh, these ideas are about minimizing how much debt you have, paying it off in a short period of time, and coming up with a plan to do so. Okay, one idea, practical application for how you might approach student loan debt. Really cool, had a call this morning where I got to talk to somebody about their student loan debt and how to pay it off. The debt snowball is a very simple concept, right? This is uh, an example where we made up somebody that had student loan debts. If you can see the bottom, kind of bottom left quadrant of this, this sheet, $37,466 is their total debt. 35,000 of that is student loan debt, which happens to be the average student loan debt for somebody leaving college with debt. That's how much they're leaving with on average today. We take these debts and we list them out one at a time, all consumer debts, right? So I've thrown in credit card debt, Capital One, I've thrown in Home Depot, I've thrown in all the student loans in rank order from smallest balance to highest balance, irregardless of the interest rate, although I did list it here, and the minimum payments associated with each one. The debt snowball is simple. It works in conjunction with a budget. So once you've done your plan for the month of, and you realize I have $100 I can put towards something, you fill it in the additional snowball payment amount. And that amount goes toward your smallest debt first. And if you work your way to the left of the screen, you'll see that if I do that, if I'm able to pay $100 extra every month above my minimum, it's gonna take me three months to pay this off, right? Three months later, you roll that debt payment, in this case, which is $120, onto your next smallest debt, which is, in this case, Home Depot. And if you do that for six additional months, you have now paid off two out of these nine debts. And you get the picture, right? This payment that you're applying to your smallest debt is, a, is the snowball rolling down the hill and it's gaining snow as it goes, okay? It's getting bigger and larger and you're making a bigger impact. Four months later, you do the same thing with the next. Four months later, the same thing with the next. Suddenly, you're 19 months in and you've paid off five out of nine debts and you're down to four, okay? By the end of this plan, you're paying $973 per month toward these debts and you have them paid off in 45 total months. Any financial advisor or person with a finance degree is going to tell you that this is absolutely wrong. Because it is wrong, right? You have a, you, one of your biggest student loan debts, your largest debt in here is at 9%. It's higher, the higher interest rate than several of the others, and I'm telling you to pay the, the lower interest debt off first? That's crazy. That's not right, and, he, and they'd be right if they had a calculator. The problem that we see, though, is, is one of human nature. It's one of having nine debts, and having, in some cases, a brand new person right out of college drowning in student loan debt and going, throwing up their hands. I have no idea where to even start. I can't even make a dent person on the phone this morning said, each of my three debts, I pay 100 bucks a month and like 83 bucks of it goes to interest. And this is the emotional part of, the human nature part of paying off debt. We struggle to a point and then we have a tendency to give up unless we see success. Not unlike losing weight, right, if you're exercising. Same idea, we, we exercise, if we don't lose weight, it can get frustrating and a lot of times we just quit. Same thing with debt. What this does is it gives people quick wins. It gives them the ability to get from nine debts to eight, from eight debts to seven, in a very, very short period of time where they're actually seeing success. And that's why it works. Now, not every, this isn't right for everyone, but it's right for a lot of people. All right, take a moment to check this out. Hopefully this is not you. 
This is the story my dad has told me about, I don't know how many times, he tells, tells me this story about every third time I see him. But it's like it's brand new every time, and I love it. When, when I was six months old, I'm the youngest of eight kids. When I was a baby, six months old, my dad uh, decided to interview for a job with Burlington Northern Railroad. He gets in his interview and they ask him, Royal, what kind of uh, equipment can you run? And he says, oh, I can run anything you got. Any type of heavy equipment you have, I can run it. Which was just a bald-faced lie. He couldn't run any, he could, he could barely run a backhoe, right? Like he, um, it, it was totally not true. But uh, he got the job, so good, good, good job, okay? Um, he, uh, he got the job, started working for the railroad, and if you know anything about Burlington Northern, or any railroad for that matter, it's very much based on seniority. The less length of time you've been there, the, um, the newer you are, the more you have to travel. So he traveled a lot. Monday through Friday, he was gone in somewhere in west, you know, eastern Wyoming or eastern Colorado or western Nebraska, working on, a, on the tracks with a gang, um, uh, doing maintenance on, on railroad tra tracks. And then he would return every Friday, spend the weekend with family, and then do it all over again on Monday. So that was kind of the norm for him early in his career with, with BN. Well, their average day ended about between three and four o'clock. And they would, wherever they were at, whatever small town, they would retire to the local bar or restaurant and get dinner and then to their motel room and get up again and do it the next day. Well, he got the hang of this kind of normal procedure for the whole gang of people that worked on the track and decided that was not going to work for him. And so he bought a metal detector. And um, you think, weird, right? Metal detector, this is kind of, that's really nerdy, dad. Um, but he did. And at four o'clock every day when they got off work, instead of going to the bar or the restaurant, he would retire to the swimming pool or the park or the public area that they had in that particular town and he would metal detect for a while. <laughs> right, do this for a while. And one day he gets done, he returns back to the motel and his gang member buddy says, gang member sounds funny when you say it that way. It's not a gang, it's, that's what they call it on the railroad. Anyway, he, uh, his buddy says to him, Royal, so how'd you do? In his pocket, pulls out a nickel and two pennies, throws them down on the, on the counter. And the guy's just laughing. He says, wow, Royal, that doesn't hardly seem worth it. You're doing it for like two and a half hours. That's like, what a waste of time. He goes, well, that's not really how I look at it. How much did you spend while I was gone? Kind of an interesting thought process that he went through. He had, this is how I became under, to understand an appreciation for all that we are given, our financial resources that we have, and how important they are to take care of and to make choices around what is important to us. Now, my dad had eight reasons, nine including my mom, at home to make different choices, right? His motivation was clear and easy to find. But we all have to find what it is that's important for us. If you're a parent, teaching appreciation, by both meanings of that word, by the way. I love appreciation because it has two meanings, right? It's like finding the enjoyment in something. It also means completely understanding a situation, right? I appreciate Scott Wright because he's a great dude, right? And I can appreciate the situation you're in, fully understand it. That's why I love this word, I think it's great. And it's certainly not about what you say, it's a, totally about what you do. So my dad certainly didn't sit me down and teach me about a financial plan. He wasn't a good student, I already shared that with you. Um, he didn't even teach me how to balance a checkbook, but he did show me a lot in the decisions that he made. I think we're all there. So a little practical application. I know as many times as I get to talk about financial well-being and how important it is for all of us, um, and how important it is for us uh, to teach here at Gallup and to spread. Um, I ne it's one of these topics you can, I can never get tired of talking about because it's so important. But a big part of this problem in, in funding college education and even getting out of student loan debt has to do with the fundamentals of the financial well-being pyramid. It has to do with building your pyramid from the ground up, right?
let's talk about this a little bit. So these are the three major things at the base of our pyramid that we encourage people to do. Establish an emergency fund, at least $1,000, because it helps to help avoid future debt, right? Where are you gonna put it? How fast can you get it? Important questions to answer. Put together a debt reduction plan. It doesn't have to be the debt snowball, but put together a plan on paper if you haven't done that already. If you currently have student loan debt and need a little guidance and help, should I consolidate, should I not? There's pros and cons to that. We won't get into all those details. Should I follow the debt snowball? We can, we can talk about it. And doing a spending plan. Decide on the format you wanna use. Take advantage of the resources we have at Gallup. This website, which there's a, um, the final slide of this deck has a, a compilation of for everybody that I think everybody in the room will be able to um, take advantage of and enjoy um, something in there, including this one, which is Gallup's financial well-being site, where you have access to tons of videos and tools on all the fundamentals, all the pyramid items that I've mentioned, as well as an online budgeting tool, which you absolutely need, it's essential. I think Ryan Wolf, if he were here, and I'll get a little audience participation, he would tell you, there are two ways to lead a healthy life. Two things you have to do if you expect to be healthy. What are they? One. Exercise. One, ding. What's the second one? Eat healthy. Right, healthy diet and exercise. Those are the two things he'd tell you. And everybody in here agrees with that, right? Those are the two things you have to do. The three things you have to do to lead a financially healthy life are have a debt reduction plan, have a spending plan, and have an emergency fund, and it's just as true. All right, good. Everybody believes me now, I'm sure of it. Um, that's why I had to ask, because I, sometimes I think people question me whether, I, whether I'm being serious on that one. Here's the well-being site where you can actually do the online budgeting tool. It's awesome, and it's free. Take advantage of this. Okay. Some practical do's and don'ts as it relates to college and student debt. Do not, or try to avoid, Overborrowing. What the heck does overborrowing mean, Ronnie? Well, never try to never borrow more than what you can make in your first year salary. I'm a college freshman. I have no idea what, what I'm gonna make coming out of school. Okay, well, never borrow more than ten thousand a year. So these are in order on purpose here, right? Try to avoid borrowing more than ten thousand a year. Avoid private loans if you can. And I hope not to offend anyone, but you need to avoid for profit universities. I have some, Ryan Fagan is not in the room, is he? He pointed me to a, a paper that I've also put the resources at the end um, by the gentleman, Steve Eisman. Anybody see the Big Short movie, the Big Short? Steve Eisman is one of the main people that was, uh, saw the housing bubble coming and took advantage of it through crazy derivatives, right? He wrote a paper to the Congress three years ago comparing for-profit universities to subprime lending. It is compelling. I take that and I combine it with some of the information that's in our own research around great lives and great jobs. You need to avoid for-profit universities. Okay, I'll, I'll be done on that. And if you're mad at me, I'm sorry. Um, do, if borrowing is necessary for you, take federal loans first, right? They're going to be the cheapest. You're gonna take subsidized loans first, which just means the interest is being paid for you while you're in school. And unsubsidized loans second, which means you're going to pay, uh, the interest is, clock is ticking on your debt while you're in school. That's the only difference. But they give you the most flexible terms and the best interest rates. So federal first. Pay as you go. This was something that, thanks to starting a job working in Gallup interviewing and thanks to um, PEGS program that Gallup had for tuition reimbursement when I was going to uh, going to school that I was able to do some of this paying as I go. Living at home is a reasonable consideration right now depending on your plan. I don't want you to have to but if it means avoiding some debt this might be a good thing. Since this is, uh, since this is um, 
three things mom and dad taught me about uh, student debt. I'll have to admit, my dad would never let me come back to the home. <laughs> I got to tell you. He's like, 18, you're done. Good luck, son. Um, and coming back was not, not really an option. And, but he was clear about that, too. Um, that, was, that was set pretty clear in stone for me. But for how, yeah, that's, that's a good one. Thank you. Save before you go. A lot of kids are working. Um, if you make less than right around $6,000 as a student, $6,000 and less, you can, that won't count toward your, when you complete your FAFSA, it won't count, it won't hurt you as far as rewarded. Six grand you can make as a student before it starts actually counting against you when you go to apply for college aid and you get your reward letter. Working part-time, or in some cases, full-time. I mean, I know that sounds crazy to some people, but um, also take a hint from the great lives, great work um, that we've done and, and try to find a, a, a work in the field that you're studying, even better. I worked for Norwest Bank, which is now Wells Fargo, and while I was interviewing on the phones, it was awesome because they were two blocks from each other. University, Norwest, Gallup. University, Norwest, Gallup. And that's what my life looked like for four years. <laughs> well, three, anyway. Um, of course, enrolling in a less expensive college. There is an unbelievable amount of effort collectively that's been put into comparing and contrasting and showing people what the cost of college is and breaking it down by tuition, by books, by living expenses. And that is something that we, you have to consider. Once you look at what you've been able to save, what you may have to borrow, then it comes down to narrowing it down to choices. Pay interest on subsidized loans while you're in school. You can do that and a lot of people don't know it. Um, loans that are unsubsidized, where the clock is ticking and your interest is growing, you can pay that while you're in school if you have the income to do so. Try to avoid borrowing for living expenses. Most all of the breakdown of costs that they show you when it comes to college are tuition, books, living expenses, other. I'm not sure what other is just yet. It's like, I don't know. It might be spring break. I'm not sure. Because <laughs> the University of Nebraska Lincoln, one I looked at a lot, it was like three grand a year and other. I'm like, that's definitely more than spring break. So I'm, I'm not sure what was in that category, but certainly try to, at a minimum, not to borrow the other expenses, the living expenses. Try to find another way to pay for those. Switching majors and transferring schools tends to lead to higher costs, right? We all know this. Try to establish residency if you're going to an out-of-state college, right? Live like a student. Uh, so one area that I have that's an issue with, with some universities out there are the money they pour into student housing and how awesome it is when they should be pouring it into things that make a difference. Nicer, not having to have a communal bathroom is not helping people appreciate their education or look back on it and say, oh, that was worth it. It's not. So I'm not harping on you. I'm saying do something different. Live like a student. Have five roommates. I, I totally did. Like three of them are still my best friends. Um, ask the hard questions of your academic advisors, right? What's realistic for me to make in this major when I get out of school? I don't think those are going to, those are being asked right now. That's directly from Valerie. Where's Valerie? Valerie, hi. That's one of your recommendations, right from your article called Maximizing the return on your higher education investment. Also a great resource right here at Gallup. Finish your degree on time, also from Valerie's article. Double major. If you're looking at a lower, your, your major that you're looking at as a primary career field isn't as high, uh, as high of paying or isn't in, as high of demand, consider a double major that can maybe offset some of that um, if it's convenient to get. So maybe you actually have an, an option for career fields. Research scholarships, another great resource at the end on a website where you can go in and put in your criteria that matches you and it will spit out a whole bunch of scholarships that you may qualify for. It's a great resource. Evaluate based on out-of-pocket costs, which is the difference between what the school costs 
and what their average award is, right? So the average level of Pell Grants, um, work studies, money that you don't have to pay back. It's the difference between those two numbers. So that's what you need to evaluate on. Um, it could be different than just the cost, right? So out-of-pocket cost is how you want to evaluate. And then completing the FAFSA, which is the free application for federal student aid as early as possible. This year, you can submit it on January 1st. Next year, next academic year, they're actually moving that due date back where you could submit it in October using the last tax return you did. There is a great link to an article on how to learn to complete a FAFSA um, and to get an estimate of what your awards would be um, without actually submitting this. So great link on that as well. All right, practical application time. Ready? Calculator, pen, pencil. I want you to make a list. Obviously, don't share with your neighbor, okay? Make a list of all your monthly debt payments. Minimum payments only, no student debt. Get this? So we're talking car loans, credit cards, consumer debts. Minimum payments only. It's the best you can do from memory. No student debt, okay? If you rent, include rent. If you have a mortgage, include your mortgage. Minimum payments only. I realize I may not be able to give you all enough time to do this because we have a limited amount of time and a learn at lunch to talk. Um, but you can keep these steps or reference this uh, slide the next time. So do not include student loans. Oh, and by the way, I should have prefaced this. This is for someone that has student loan debt. Debt. Okay, so if you have student loan debt, this will be applicable to you. Um, but if you don't, it's okay. We'll, we'll actually, there's a way to ref make this applicable as well. Sum your list of minimum debt payments. So get that number totaled up and set it to the side. Put a circle around it. Come back to it. Using your calculator, determine your household monthly gross income. So if I make 50 grand, my gross income is... 41.66 a month, gross, right? No taxes. Get that number set it aside, put a circle around it. Multiply, and this is gonna feel weird. If you have student loan debt, here's where it is. Multiply your student loan balance times 1.17. People look at this going, what? That makes no sense. It will in a minute. I'll explain in a minute. So now we're just looking at how much I owe in student debt times 1.17. Okay. Divide that new number that you just did, student debt times 1.17, divide that by 60. This is the monthly student loan payment required to pay off your debt in five years. This is what it would require. How did I get that? I used an average interest rate of 6.1, which is the average right now. So it may not be perfect for you, but we're estimating, okay? So 1.17 would get you there, includes interest over five year period of time. That, that number you just calculated is the payment you need to make to pay it off in five years. So we're gonna sum this new payment plus the total debts from step two. The number you circled, minimum debt payments, take that, plus this amount you just calculated. Add that together. And take that debt number, the new number you just added, divided by monthly gross income. By 100. If you were born after 1980, if you're born after 1980 and your number is more than 35%, that's a ratio by the way, 35, we need to talk about a plan that will get you out of debt. 35% is your debt to income ratio and that's what we recommend, 35% or less. If you're born prior to 1980, your number is 30%. And if it's more than that, we should talk about a plan to get you out of that debt. 
Does that make sense? You just calculated a debt to income ratio and the levels for recommendations are different depending on your age. It's different for everybody in here, but that's a general way to calculate it and it's an important thing to know. Let, it's not a, an amount that banks will lend you up to, by the way, because most of their standards are at 45%. It's just unsustainable. You don't want that. Um, but if you're born after 1980, 35% or less. Before 1980, 30% or less. Debt to income, the ratio you just calculated, is kind of like the opposite of BMI, body mass index, right? <laughs> well, we have a tendency when we get older to get a little bit fatter, right? Our BMI tends to go up a little bit. Well, we need the opposite to happen with DTI. When we get closer to retirement, we want to be getting out of debt, right? Hopefully so that we're not carrying debt with us into retirement. We can live debt-free, at least, if not earlier. So it's kind of like the exact opposite. Here's the point. Intensity totally, absolutely, and definitely is required if you're going to get out of debt. You, you may be able to walk your way into it as a student, kind of just cool, college is awesome and this is great and I'm gonna do what I need to do, but you can't walk your way out. You absolutely can't. Intensity is required. I showed this quote, this one to my, to my wife. He said, what does that mean? It's not necessary to change. Survival is not mandatory. Change the word survival with success. So you don't have to change. You, and you don't have to be successful, but I'm telling you, getting out of student loan debt or helping your future student avoid it is a surefire way to help yourself build financial wealth and have success financially. So that's what it means. I sometimes maybe get over dramatic about finances and how important they are, but they are important. They're incredibly important to the your well being of your life, to every aspect of well being. And so, Intensity is required. It's not something you can do casually. In fact, if I, I can most of the time predict when I sit and meet with someone and we're talking about a debt plan with a fair level of accuracy, whether or not they'll be successful in actually meeting that plan. Because you almost need to get pissed off, honestly. You need to get a little bit angry at it, and, and that helps to drive you to continue it because this is not, for most people, leaving school with 35, 45, getting an advanced degree, 70, $80,000 of debt. It is not something you get without being intense and very intentional about it. Okay, so these recommendations. Clear expectations, teaching and practicing as a parent, appreciation, being a steward of those resources, and getting intense about making a positive changes, whether that be to get out of debt or to help yourself avoid it by being intentional and committed. We are almost out of time. Here are, is the last slide, a slide of resources that I wanted to quickly talk to you about. Um, one is sit down and read this report. It's not very long and it is incredibly good. I love this report that Gallup did on great jobs and great lives. Um, Maximizing your return from Valerie Calderon. She's famous now. Um, maximizing your return on your investment in higher education. Awesome hints and, and suggestions on how to do that. Subprime goes to college that I referenced earlier is that five pager um, comparing for-profit educational industry to um, subprime lending. Looking at high demand jobs from the Bureau of Labor and Stats. Um, use this free resource, the Wellbeing website um, and Fastweb.com is the one for ships where you can enter criteria on you or your child and, um, and hopefully take advantage of, of some free money that doesn't have to be repaid for college. Education, Education Quest, this is a cool site. Please check this out. You can do a, um, a, this pretty sophisticated filtering of, of national universities, colleges, um, private, public, you name it. Um, according to criteria, and I mean pretty minute criteria. If your kid wants to make sure they go to a university that has a band because trumpet is their thing, you can sort by universities that have a band. I mean, you can get it very detailed by cost, um, by number of students at a university, which I think is incredibly important, especially looking at some of the Gallup data. 
And then I referenced uh, predicting your uh, FAFSA uh, awards letter prior to going to college. This is the place you can do it, FAFSA Forecaster, um, where it will give you your expect expected or estimated. There's a little bit of uh, difference in how those things are interpreted. Is it expected or is it estimated? Family contribution, how much are mom and dad paying? Um, versus your uh, child's needs analysis before you go. And then, last but not least, that Warren Buffett video is an hour long and it's awesome. Watch the whole thing. Um, I just showed you two and a half minutes of it, but it's great. With that, we have like three minutes left and I would love to take any questions um, that you might have. Fire away. Hearing none. Thank oh, Scott. I'll, I'll, I'll throw it out there. Yeah. Prior to yeah. High Fair you, point. How do you change that? I mean, yeah. 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 The question was that um, you know you said try not to trans try not to change majors because that's going to actually cost you more. You have to take more classes um, in an effort to save money. And at the beginning of the presentation, I said. Well, how many of you actually knew what you wanted to do when you started college? And it seems, and it seems like a contradiction. And I totally agree. It is. The um, I I went started to go to school undeclared. Uh, didn't know what I wanted to be, and but had to kind of shortly figure it out. Um, and so I realized that is to do. But in the if you're somebody that has to borrow a lot um, for student loans, I uh, in the form of student debt, I think it's. It's it's worth making that choice an election earlier rather than later. Good, that's fair. Fair contradiction, Scott. Yep. It is now one. Thank you guys very much.